Chapter Thirty of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of seventeen fifty seven by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirty. Quote, if you deny me, fie upon your law. There is no force in the decrees of Venice. I stand for judgment. Answer, shall I have it? Unquote. Merchant of Venice. The silence continued unbroken by human sounds for many anxious minutes. Then the waving multitude opened and shut again, and Uncas stood in the living circle. All those eyes which had been curiously studying the lineaments of the sage, as the source of their own intelligence, turned on the instant, and were now bent in secret admiration on the erect, agile, and faultless person of the captive. But neither the presence in which he found himself, nor the exclusive attention that he attracted in any manner disturbed the self-possession of the young Mohican. He cast a deliberate and observing look on every side of him meeting the settled expression of hostility that lowered in the visages of the chiefs, with the same calmness as the curious gaze of the attentive children. But when, last in his haughty scrutiny, the person of Tomanund came under his glance, his eye became fixed, as though all other objects were already forgotten. Then, advancing with a slow and noiseless step up the area, he placed himself immediately before the footstool of the sage, where he stood unnoted, though keenly observant himself, until one of the chiefs apprised the latter of his presence. With what tongue does the prisoner speak to the Manitou? demanded the patriarch, without unclosing his eyes. Like his father's, Uncas replied with the tongue of the Delaware. At this sudden and unexpected annunciation, a low, fierce yell ran through the multitude that might not inaptly be compared to the growl of the lion as his collar is first awakened, fearful omen of the weight of his future anger. The effect was equally strong on the sage, though differently exhibited. He passed his hand before his eyes as if to exclude the least evidence of so shameful a spectacle, while he repeated his low, guttural tones, the words he had just heard. A Delaware? I have lived to see the tribes of the Lenape driven from their council fires, and scattered like broken herds of deer among the hills of the Iroquois. I have seen the hatchets of a strong people sweep woods from the valleys, and the winds of heaven have spared the beasts that run on the mountains, and the birds that fly above the trees have I seen living in the wigwams of men. But never before have I found a Delaware so base as to creep like a poisonous serpent into the camps of his nation. The singing birds have opened their bills, returned Uncas in the softest notes of his own musical voice, and Tamanund has heard their song. The sage started and bent his head aside, as if to catch the fleeting sounds of some passing melody. Does Tanamon dream? he exclaimed. What voice is at his ear? Have the winters gone backward? Will summer come again to the children of the Lenape? A solemn and respectful silence succeeded this incoherent burst from the lips of the Delaware prophet. His people readily constructed his unintelligible language into one of those mysterious conferences he was believed to hold so frequently with a superior intelligence, and they awaited the issue of the revelation in awe. After a patient pause, however, one of the aged men, perceiving that the sage had lost the recollection of the subject before him, ventured to remind him again of the presence of the prisoner. The false Delaware dribbles, 
lest he should hear the words of Tamanund, he said. "'Tis a howl that howls when the Yankees show him a trail." "'And ye,' returned Uncas, looking sternly around him, "'are dogs that whine when the Frenchman cast the offals of his deer." Twenty knives gleamed in the air, and as many warriors sprang to their feet at this biting and perhaps merited retort, but a motion from one of the chiefs suppressed the outbreaking of their tempers, and restored the appearance of quiet. The task might probably have been more difficult, had not a movement made by Tamanund indicated that he was again about to speak. "'Delaware,' resumed the sage, "'little art thou worthy of thy name. My people have not seen a bright sun in many winters, and the warrior who deserts his tribe when hid in clouds is doubly a traitor. The law of the Manito is just. It is so, while the rivers run and the mountains stand, but the blossoms come and go on the trees. It must be so. He is thine, my children. Deal justly by him. Not a limb was moved, nor a breath drawn louder and longer than common, until the closing syllable of this final decree had passed the lips of Tamanund. Then a cry of vengeance burst at once, as it might be from the united lips of the nation, a frightful augury of their ruthless intentions. In the midst of these prolonged and savage yells, a chief proclaimed in a high voice that the captive was condemned to endure the dreadful trial of torture by fire. The circle broke its order, and screams of delight mingled with the bustle and tumult of preparation. Hayward struggled madly with his captors. The anxious eye of Hawkeye began to look around him with an expression of peculiar earnestness, and Cora, again threw herself at the feet of the patriarch, once more a suppliant for mercy. Throughout the whole of these trying moments, Uncas had alone preserved his serenity. He looked on the preparations with a steady eye, and when the tormentors came to seize him, he met them with a firm and upright attitude. One among them, if possible more fierce and savage than his fellows, seized the hunting shirt of the young warrior, and at a single effort tore it from his body. Then, with a yell of frantic pleasure, he leaped toward his unresisting victim, and prepared to lead him to the stake. But at that moment, when he appeared most a stranger to the feeling of humanities, the purpose of the savage was arrested, as suddenly as if a supernatural agency had interposed in the behalf of Uncas. The eyes of the Delaware seemed to start from their sockets. His mouth opened, and his whole form became frozen in an attitude of amazement. Raising his hand, with a slow and regulated motion, he pointed with the finger to the bosom of the captive. His companions crowded about him in wonder, and every eye was like his own, fastened intently on the figure of a small tortoise beautifully tattooed on the breast of the prisoner, in a bright blue tint. For a single instant Uncas enjoyed his triumph, smiling calmly on the scene, then motioning the crowd away with a high and haughty sweep of his arm. He advanced in front of the nation with the air of a king, and spoke in a voice louder than the murmur of admiration that ran through the multitude. Men of the Mleni Lenape, he said, my race upholds the earth. Your feeble tribes stands on my shell. What fire that a Delaware can light would burn the child of my fathers, he added, pointing proudly to the simple blazonry on his skin. The blood that came from such a stock would smother your flames. My race is the grandfather of nations. Who art thou? demanded Tamanund, rising at the startling tones he heard, more than any meaning conveyed by the language of the prisoner. Ancus, son of Chingachgook, answered the captive modestly, turning from the nation and bending his head in reverence to the other's character in years. A son of the great Unimus. Footnote. Turtle. 
End footnote. The hour of Tamanan is nigh, exclaimed the sage. The day is come at last to the night. I thank the Manitou. The one is here to fill my place at the council fire. Uncas, the child of Uncas, is found. Let the eyes of a dying eagle gaze on the rising sun. The youth stepped lightly but proudly on the platform, where he became visible to the whole agitated and wondering multitude. Tamanon held him long at the length of his arm, and read every turn in the fine lineaments of his countenance, with the untiring gaze of one who recalled days of happiness. "'Is Tamanon a boy?' at length the bewildered prophet exclaimed. "'Have I dreamed of so many snows that my people were scattered like floating sands? Of Yengis, more plenty than the leaves on the trees, the arrow of Tamanon would not frighten the fawn. His arm is withered like the branch of a dead oak. The snail would be swifter in the race. It is Uncas before him, as they went to battle against the pale faces. Uncas, the panther of his tribe, the eldest son of the Lenape, the wisest Sagamore of the Mohicans. Tell me, Ye Delawares, has Tomlin been a sleeper for a hundred winters? The calm and deep silence which succeeded these words sufficiently announced the awful reverence with which his people received all communication of the patriarch. None dared to answer, though all listened in breathless expectation of what might follow. Uncas, however, looking in his face with a fondness and veneration of a favored child, presumed on his own high and acknowledged rank to reply. Four warriors of his race have lived and died, he said, since the fire of Tamanan led his people to battle. The blood of the turtle has been in many chiefs, but all have gone back into the earth from whence they came, except Chingachgook and his son. It is true. It is true, returned the sage, a flash of recollection destroying all his pleasing fancies, and restoring him at once to a consciousness of the true history of his nation. Our wise men have often said that two warriors of the unchanged race were in the hills of the Yengeese. Why have their seats at the council fires of the Delawares been so long empty? At these words the young man raised his head, which he had still kept bowed a little in reverence, and lifting his voice so as to be heard by the multitude, as if to explain at once and forever the policy of his family, he said aloud, Once we slept where we could hear the Salt Lake speak of his anger. Then we were rulers and sagamores over the land. But when a pale face was seen on every brook, we followed the deer back to the river of our nation. The Delawares are gone. Few warriors of them all stayed to drink of the stream they love. They said, My fathers, here will we hunt. The waters of the river go into the salt lake. If we go toward the setting sun, we shall find streams that run into the great lakes of the sweet water. There would a Mohican die like fishes of the sea in the clear springs. When the Manito is ready and shall say, Come, we will follow the river to the sea and take our own again. Such Delawares is the belief of the children of the turtle. Our eyes are on the rising and not toward the setting sun. We know whence he comes, but we know not whither he goes. It is enough. The men of the Lenape listened to his words with all the respect that superstition could lend, finding a secret charm even in the figurative language with which the young Sagamore imparted his ideas. Uncas himself watched the effect of his brief explanation with intelligent eyes, and gradually dropped the air of authority he had assumed, as he perceived 
that his auditors were content. Then, permitting his looks to wander over the silent throng that crowded around the elevated seat of Tamanund, he first perceived Hawkeye in his bounds. Stepping eagerly from his stand, he made way for himself to the side of his friend, and cutting his thong with a quick and angry stroke of his own knife, he motioned to the crowd to divide. The Indians silently obeyed, and once more they stood ranged in their circle. As before his appearance among them, Uncas stood the scout by the hand, and led him to the feet of the patriarch. Father, he said, look at his pale face, a just man, and the friend of the Delawares. Is he a son of Minquam? Not so, a warrior known to the Yengis, and feared by the Maquas. What name has he gained by his deeds? We call him Hawkeye, Uncas replied, using the Delaware phrase, for his sight never fails. The Mingos know him better by the death he gives their warriors. With them he is the Long Rifle. That long carabine, exclaimed Talmanon, opening his eyes and regarding the scout sternly. My son has not done well to call him friend. I call him soul who proves himself such, returned the young chief, with great calmness, but with a steady mien. If Uncas is welcome among the Delawares, then is Hawkeye with his friends. The pale face has slain my young men. His name is great for the blows he has struck the Lenape. If a Mingo has whispered that much in the ear of the Delaware, he has only shown that he is a singing bird, said the scout, who now believed that it was time to vindicate himself from such offensive charges, and who spoke as the man he addressed, modifying his Indian figures, however, with his own peculiar notions. That I have slain the Maquas, I am not the man to deny, even at their own council fires, but that knowingly my hand has never harmed the Delaware, is opposed to the reason of my gifts, which is friendly to them, and all that belongs to their nation. A low exclamation of applause passed among the warriors who exchanged looks at each other, like men that first began to perceive their error. "'Where is the Huron?' demanded Tomanund. "'Has he stopped my ears?' Maqua, whose feelings during that scene in which Uncas had triumphed may be much better imagined than described, answered to the call by stepping boldly in front of the patriarch. "'The just Tamanund,' he said, "'will not keep what the Huron has lent. "'Tell me, son, of my brother,' returned the sage, avoiding the dark countenance of Le Subtil, and turning gladly to the more ingenious features of Uncas. Has the stranger the conqueror's right over you? He has none. The panther may get into snares set by the women, but he is strong, and knows how to leap through them. The long carabine? Laughs at the Mingos. Go, Huron. Ask your squalls, the color of a bear. The stranger and white maiden that come into my camp together should journey an open path. And the woman that Huron left with my warriors? Uncas made no reply. And the woman that the Mingo has brought into my camp, repeated Tamanund gravely. She is mine, cried Maqua, shaking his hand in triumph at Uncas. Mohican, you know that she is mine. My son is silent, said Tamanund, endeavoring to read the expression of the face that the youth turned from him in sorrow. It is so, was the low answer. A short and impressive pause succeeded, during which it was very apparent with what reluctance the multitude admitted the justice of the Mingo's claim. 
At length the sage, on whom alone the decision depended, said in a firm voice, Huron, depart. As he came, just tamanund, demanded the wily Magua, or with hands filled with the faith of the Delawares. The wigwam of Le Renard Subtil is empty. Make him strong with his own. The aged man mused with himself for a while, and then bending his head toward one of his venerable companions, he asked, Are my ears open? It is true. Is this Mingo a chief? The first in his nation. Girl, what wouldst thou? A great warrior takes thee to wife. Go, thy race will not end. Better a thousand times it should, exclaimed the horror-struck Cora, than meet with such a degradation. Huron, her mind is in the tents of her fathers. An unwilling maiden makes an unhappy wigwam. She speaks the tongue of her people, returned Magua, regarding his victim with a look of bitter irony. She is of a race of traitors, and will bargain for a bright look. Let Tamanon speak the words. Take you the wampum and our love. Nothing hence but what Magua brought hither. Then depart with thine own. The great Manitou forbids that a Delaware should be unjust. Mokwa advanced, and seized his captive strongly by the arm. The Delawares fell back in silence, and Cora, as if conscious that remonstrance would be useless, prepared to submit to her fate without resistance. "'Hold! Hold!' cried Duncan, springing forward. "'Huron, have mercy!' Her ransom shall make thee richer than any of thy people were ever yet known to be. Makwa is a redskin. He wants not the beads of the pale faces. Gold, silver, powder, lead, all that the warrior needs shall be in thy wigwam, all that becomes the greatest chief. Le Subtil is very strong cried Makwa, violently shaking the hand which grasped the unresisting arm of Cora. He has his revenge! Mighty ruler of providence! exclaimed Hayward, clasping his hands together in agony. Can this be suffered? To you, just Tamanon, I appeal for your mercy! The words of the Delaware are said, returned the sage, closing his eyes and dropping back into his seat, alike wearied with his mental and bodily exertion. Men speak not twice. That a chief should not misspend his time in saying what has been spoken is wise and reasonable, said Hawkeye, motioning to Duncan to be silent. But it is also prudent in every warrior to consider well before he strikes his tomahawk into the head of his prisoner. Huron, I love you not, nor can I say that any Mingo has ever received much favor at my hands. It is fair to conclude that, if this war does not soon end, many more of your warriors will meet me in the woods. Put it to your judgment, then, whether you would prefer taking such a prisoner as that into your encampment, or one like myself, who am a man that it would greatly rejoice your nation to see with naked hands. "'Will the long rifle give his life for the woman?' demanded Magua hesitatingly, for he had already made a motion toward quitting the place with his victim. "'No, no, I have not said so much as that,' returned Hawkeye, drawing back with suitable discretion, when he noted the eagerness with which Magua listened to his proposal. It would be an unequal exchange to give a warrior in the prime of his age and usefulness for the best woman on the frontiers. I might consent to go into winter quarters now, at least six weeks before the leaves will turn, on condition you will release the maiden. Mokwa shook his head, and made an impatient sigh for the crowd to open. Well then, added the scout, with the musing air of a man who had not half made up his mind. 
I will throw Kildeer into the bargain. Take the word of an experienced hunter. The peace has not its equal atween the provinces. Maqua still disdained to reply, continuing his efforts to disperse the crowd. Perhaps, added the scout, losing his dissembled coolness exactly in proportion as the other manifested an indifference to the exchange, if I should condition to teach your young men the real virtue of the weapon, it would smooth the little differences in our judgments. Le Renard fiercely ordered the Delawares, who still lingered in an impenetrable belt around him, in hopes he would listen to the amicable proposal to open his path, threatening by the glance of his eye another appeal of the infallible justice of their prophet. What is ordered must sooner or later arrive, continued Hawkeye, turning with a sad and humbled look to Uncas. The varlet knows his advantage, and will keep it. God bless you, boy. You have found friends among your natural kin, and I hope they will prove as true as some you have met who had no Indian cross. As for me, sooner or later I must die. It is, therefore, fortunate there are but few to make my death howl. After all, it is likely the imps would have managed to master my scalp. So a day or two will make no great difference in the everlasting reckoning of time. God bless you added the rugged woodsman, bending his head aside, and then instantly changing its direction again, with a wistful look toward the youth. I love both you and your father, Uncas. Though our skins are not altogether of a color, and our gifts are somewhat different, tell the Sagamore I never lost sight of him in my greatest trouble. And as for you, think of me sometimes, when on a lucky trail, and depend on it, boy. Whether there be one heaven or two, there is a path in the other world by which honest men may come together again. You'll find the rifle in the place we hid it. Take it, and keep it for my sake. And hark ye, lad, as your natural gifts don't deny you the use of vengeance, use it a little freely on the Mingos. It may unburden Greece at my loss and ease your mind. Huron, I accept your offer. Release the woman. I am your prisoner. A suppressed but still distinct murmur of approbation ran through the crowd at this generous proposition. Even the fiercest among the Delaware warriors manifesting pleasure at the manliness of the intended sacrifice. Maqua paused, and for an anxious moment it might be said, he doubted. Then, casting his eyes on Cora, with an expression in which ferocity and admiration were strangely mingled, his purpose became fixed. Forever. He intimated his contempt of the offer with a backward motion of his head, and said, in a steady and settled voice, Le Renard Subtil is a great chief. He has but one mind. Come, he added, laying his hand too familiarly on the shoulder of his captive to urge her onward. A Huron is no tattler. We will go. The maiden drew back in lofty womanly reserve, and her dark eye kindled, while the rich blood shot like passing brightness of the sun into her very temples at the indignity. I am your prisoner and at a fitting time shall be ready to follow even to my death. But violence is unnecessary, she coldly said, and immediately, turning to Hawkeye, added, Generous hunter, from my soul I thank you. Your offer is vain, neither could it be accepted. But still you may serve me, even more, than in your own noble intention. Look at that drooping humble child. Abandon her not until you leave her in the habitations of civilized men. I will not say, wringing the hard hand of the scout, that her father will reward you, for such as you are above the rewards of men. 
but he will thank you and bless you. And believe me, the blessing of a just and aged man has virtue in the sight of heaven. Would to God I could hear one word from his lips at this awful moment. Her voice became choked, and for an instant she was silent. Then, advancing a step nigher to Duncan, who was supporting her unconscious sister, she continued, in more subdued tones, but in which feeling and the habits of her sex maintained a fearful struggle. I need not tell you to cherish the treasure you possess. You love her, Hayward. That would conceal a thousand faults. Though she had them, she is kind, gentle, sweet, good, as mortal may be. There is not a blemish in mind or person at which the proudest of you all would sicken. She is fair, oh, oh, how surpassingly fair, laying her own beautiful but less brilliant hand in melancholy affection on the alabaster forehead of Alice, and parting the golden hair which clustered about her brows. And yet her soul is pure and spotless as her skin. I could say much more, perhaps, than cooler reason would approve, but I will spare you and myself. Her voice became inaudible, and her face was bent over the form of her sister. After a long and burning kiss, she arose, and with features of the hue of death, but without even a tear in her feverish eye, she turned away and added to the savage, with all her former elevation of manner, Now, sir, if it be your pleasure, I will follow. I go, cried Duncan placing Alice in the arms of an Indian girl. Go, Magua, go! These Delawares have their laws which forbid them to detain you. But I, I have no such obligation. Go, malignant monster! Why do you delay? It would be difficult to describe the expression with which Magua listened to this threat to follow. There was, at first, a fierce and manifest display of joy, and then it was instantly subdued in a look of cunning coldness. The words are open, he was content with answering. The open hand can come. Hold, cried Hawkeye, seizing Duncan by the arm and detaining him by violence. You know not the craft of the imp. He would lead you to an ambushment and your death. You're on, interrupted Uncas, who, submissive to the stern customs of his people, had been an attentive and grave listener to all that passed. You're on. The justice of the Delawares comes from the Manitou. Look at the sun. He is now in the upper branches of the hemlock. Your path is short and open. When he is seen above the trees, there will be men on your trail. I hear a crow, exclaimed Maqua with a taunting laugh. Go, he added, shaking his hand at the crowd, which had slowly opened to admit his passage. Where are the petticoats of the Delawares? Let them send their arrows and their guns to the Wyandots. They shall have venison to eat and corn to hoe, dogs, rabbits, thieves, I speak. Pit on you! His parting jibes were listened to in a dead, boding silence, and, with these biting words in his mouth, the triumphant Maqua passed unmolested into the forest, followed by his passive captive, and protected by the inviolable laws of Indian hospitality. End of chapter 30 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin in Yukon, Pennsylvania, in January of 2008.